see see your faces or see part of your faces, and she's just uh, good to be with you. I, uh, we were on our way here this morning, and about halfway here, Gibson was coughing so badly in the back seat that we turned around and went back and took him and Maple home. So if y'all will keep both of them in your prayers, I'd appreciate it. Uh, just cold that won't seem to go away, but it, I, we think it's just a cold. So let's uh, go ahead and jump into the lesson today. Uh, Matt got up this morning and read a, a reading on love and how the Bible defines love and the importance of love. And uh, Scott did a very capable and wonderful job of explaining why it is that, that God loves us and even made the statement of it's Valentine's Day, so this is what we should be talking about. So this morning I'm going to talk to you about when life falls apart. That uh, just seems, seems appropriate. In the, uh, it, it, it's going to relate to love, but to be honest, I, I do want to talk to you a bit about how life falls apart. And um, I, I can think back in my life many, many times where things didn't go the way I had planned and expected things to go. Uh, I remember back in about fifth grade, I had decided at that point I was going to be a chiropractor. The one thing I knew I did not want to do was preach. I had watched my dad preach, and I had determined that was not the life for me. And so in my head, for whatever reason, I'm not even sure why this was the conclusion I came to, I decided I was going to be a chiropractor. I had never been to a chiropractor, but the idea of cracking people's bones and putting things back in place just appealed to me for whatever reason in my fifth grade mind. And I stuck with that as my plan all the way up through my second year of college. That was what I wanted to do. I went to college and I took medical classes and biology and anatomy and all the things you needed to take to be a, on a pre-chiropractic track. And you know what changed my mind? Love. I met Tiffany. And I decided at about uh, six months of dating Tiffany that I didn't want to be in college for the next four to six years of my life, and it was better to get married and to find something else to do, and that's what I ended up doing. Still not planned on preaching. I went into accounting classes because I had a job working in the treasury department of a computer company, and I decided I hated that, and so then I went into administration, decided I didn't particularly care for that, and so then I decided to go into nursing, and while in nursing school, the day before my midterm exams, I got appendicitis and ended up in the hospital, got out the next day, just two days before my exams, got out the next day, and in our school, our nursing school, you could not make up exams for any reason, and so I went on painkillers across the, about an hour drive to take my midterm nursing exams and took my straight A's down to straight C's. Did real well. Not really sure what I put on those answers. And that was the time that a church said, hey, why don't you come preach for us? And I did. Completely derailed my plans completely detoured away from what I had decided my life was going to be about and what I was going to do and how I was going to make a living and how I was going to piece everything together, everything fell apart and landed me another direction. You ever have that happen to you? Has that been your story? I would bet if we went around the room, not only would we have fun doing this, but we would see a pattern. If I were to ask you, when you were 10 years old, what did you want to do with your life? I can bet not only would that be interesting, probably not a single one of us, if maybe one or two, went that direction we had decided at 10 years old. Because we're this, this is kind of how life works, is it not? Life derails. We expect detours in the way. 
we expect that we are going to have to at some point change our plans, go a different route, think a different way. Somehow, some way, things are going to change. And I don't know what it was for you that did that. Maybe maturity. You just kind of grew up. You know, you, you at that one point want to be an astronaut, and then at some point you realize you don't care for math enough to actually want to be an astronaut, and so you go a different way. You grow up. You, you, just, you get different ideas as to what you want to do when you grow up. Maybe it's realism. You realize you really have a bent in this direction, even though your plan says you should go this direction, and so you start following what is more realistic instead of what is more dream-based. could be obstacles that pop up. Um, has the death of a loved one ever changed your plans entirely? Has the loss of a job that you weren't expecting ever changed your plans entirely? Has moving or sickness or whatever the obstacle is that pops in your way changed your plans entirely? Circumstances pop up. Or in my case, I found something better. I found my wife. My wife versus chiropractor. I think I made the good choice, personally. She's not here. Man, supposed to save those kind of statements for when she can hear them, right? Uh, it, it, there can be countless reasons as to why your life turns out differently than you expected your life to turn out. And some of those are bad and some of those are good, but what we can expect in life is that there's going to be detours along the way. And I think the same is true when it comes to even following God. That we have in our minds a certain way that we're going to do things, a certain way that we're going to follow God, a certain way that we're going to obey, and there are times when that gets detoured. I read a book, this past, finished reading a book this past week called Becoming Elizabeth Elliot. My wife and I decided, because I told her, I said, I want to read three books a month this year. That's my goal to read three books a month this year. And she said, okay, well, why don't we make an agreement that once every three month, months you can give me a book that I have to read, no questions asked, and I can't complain about it, and I'll do the same for you. And I hem and hauled about agreeing to this because I have no idea what she was going to make me read, and I'm not really sure I trust her reading choices. But I finally agreed to it, and she had me read this book called Becoming Elizabeth Elliot. And it was a fantastic book. If you don't know who Elizabeth Elliot is, she is the wife of Jim Elliot, who was a missionary. And very early in their marriage, about two and a half years into their marriage, they were living overseas, and he was speared to death along with three other men uh, as a result of trying to reach this native uh, tribe of people who ended up attacking them, killing them, and Elizabeth Elliot was left without a husband in a foreign country, living in a jungle, living on her own. And it's a fascinating story, but it got me thinking about this idea of what do you do when you get derailed, when you get detoured, when life doesn't turn out the way you expected it to turn out. Because that story of having her husband die and all of a sudden she is left holding the burden and the weight of this foundling group of people who are trying to obey God and follow the Bible and translating the Bible into that language. She's left with all this work to do that she never intended to do on her own. What does she do in that case? Does she hop on a plane and head home and give up? Does she continue on doing the hard work that she had agreed to do because she was doing it for God instead of doing it for man? What do you do? That's, that's a hard question for us to answer. The reality is God has a plan, and his plan is clear. You know, he provides salvation through sacrifice. We won't look at all these passages, but there's, there's a lot of passages that talk about God's plan of providing 
salvation for mankind. We're studying that as we go through the Old Testament. You've got passages like Romans chapter 5, verse 12 and following, which talk about Adam bringing sin into the world and that the second Adam brought salvation into the world, that we all needed that salvation because we've all sinned, we've all messed up, we've all failed to meet the standard. And so God had to provide salvation, and as Scott brought up at the table, God did it through his son because he loves us. That's God's plan. God's plan was that we learn to accept that sacrifice through our own sacrifice. The very next chapter, Romans chapter 6, the very beginning, talked about the idea of dying with Christ, that we are buried with Christ, and we understand that to be baptism, you know, the being buried in the water and raised to walk in newness of life. But it goes on in that passage, the part that we don't often quote is the part that I think is probably most important in that passage. It says there, verse 3 and 4, that we're buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the, bo so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin. The imagery there is not just death in the watery grave of baptism, but death to a life lived by our own rules and standards. We sacrifice ourselves for the sake of gaining the salvation offered through the sacrifice of Jesus. Do you see how that works? There's sacrifice on each side. Jesus offers himself as the sacrifice that was necessary to get rid of sin, but we must sacrifice our life of sin in order to follow after him. That's God's plan. And then we know 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about the idea that we're given this that we become ambassadors, that we have this message of reconciliation and we go out to the world and we share with the world the message of reconciliation, that God reconciles sinful people to himself by taking away their sins and making them right before him. That's our message. This is God's plan. God made salvation possible we give ourselves to salvation through sacrifice, and we share that message with others. But there are times when that process gets derailed. Particularly that second part where we want to go out there and we want to share that message of reconciliation with people, the story of God's love, the story of how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should be saved. That, that, that's what we want to do. And so sometimes we go out there and we, we deliver that message to the world and we tell them about how wonderful it is that God did this thing for you and me. But all of a sudden we find ourselves detoured away from that. We find ourselves not able to accomplish the plan that God put in place. We find ourselves unable to share that message either because of circumstances, because obstacles arise in the way. We find ourselves unable. Or maybe another way of putting it is that we find ourselves trying to accomplish a plan, but we find out that God's plan is very different than ours. That God's plan doesn't look the way our plan looks. That we want to go out and we want to do this in a very easy and calm and gentle and compassionate way. We want to go out there and, and just enjoy people and have them enjoy us. And so we've got this plan in place that will help us get the gospel out there, but that's not God's plan. God's plan wasn't that it would be easy God had something else in mind, something very difficult. 
we like to think that the best way to get out there and share the message is through PR, through mass marketing. Let's put a billboard on the side of the highway that says, Edward Lake Church of Christ down here with an arrow pointing down at our building. And that, that's going to bring people in in droves and then we don't really have to do a lot of work. We just got to wait for them to come to us and then we'll just be ready to hand them a flyer. And then we can expect that, that pretty soon they're going to come back to us and go, hey, I need to be baptized and we're going to celebrate and it's going to be fun and easy. Does it work that way? No. It, it doesn't. Or we expect whenever we we baptize somebody and we, we watch them and celebrate with them that they've had the old man crucified and washed away those sins that now they're going to be faithful and godly and holy and, and it should be easy. Does it work that way? No. People come with baggage. People come with, with ideas different than our own. People are concerned about things that we don't particularly care about, and now we have to be concerned about them too. And that's difficult. It's difficult to face that sometimes. There's a couple of stories in the Bible that really show this. Think back with me through the story of Moses. We know Moses. He was chosen by God, right? He was a beautiful baby. His mom thought so, but apparently so did whoever wrote the book of Exodus. Beautiful baby. And his mom didn't want to kill him the way the Pharaoh had determined and pronounced that all the Hebrew baby boys were to be killed. And so she hid him. And then when that got difficult, she placed him in a basket and placed him among the reeds in the Nile River where... Pharaoh's daughter would find him. And we have the story there of how Pharaoh's daughter took him into her own home and actually even hired Moses' own mom to come and be his nursemaid. And that worked out so beautifully, didn't it? I mean, when you see something work out like that, you, you think, this is going to be great. There's nothing that's going to get in the way of this plan. You know the story of Moses, don't you? Moses is 40 years old. He's been raised and educated by all the education of Egypt. He knows he, he's probably being raised as a sort of ambassador to the Hebrew people. He's going to be a, a governmental official and represent those people, is, is my guess. But he decides he doesn't want to be Egyptian anymore. He doesn't want to watch his people suffer and so he gets into his mind that he's going to be the rescuer and he goes out there and he kills an Egyptian man and his own people reject him and he runs. So for the next 40 years, Moses, the man who was raised in the glamour and glory of an Egyptian palace is run out to live in a wilderness as a shepherd. And it seems he becomes okay with that. Like, it, you don't see a lot of begrudging. You don't see uh, really any sort of desire to go back to Egypt and to get things back the way they were because when God calls him at 80 years old and says, hey, I've got a job for you to do, what's Moses' response? Uh, not me. I'm not the man for the job. Choose somebody else. God's unwilling. See, Moses wanted the peace of the wilderness, but God wanted him to be a worker. And so he goes back to the Pharaoh, as God commands, and he demands that the Pharaoh let the people go. And Pharaoh says no. And so he has to bring plagues among the Egyptian people, people that he probably knew. Watch them suffer with plague after plague after plague. 
going to the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh kept changing his mind. Sure, let him go. Just make all this horrific stuff go away. And he'd make it go away. And Pharaoh would change his mind and say no again. And so every time it seemed like it was going to work out, it doesn't. And they have to start over again with Pharaoh. And the plagues get worse and worse. And finally, after the last plague, Pharaoh says, yes, you may go. And they go out into the wilderness. They want to escape unscathed. That's not what Pharaoh wants. He pursues. My guess is Moses, having traveled from the mountain of God to Egypt, knew exactly the way to get back from Egypt to the mountain of God, but that's not the way God took him. God took him this long, windy, confusing way through the wilderness to the point that Pharaoh thought, based on the spies' reports, that Moses was lost. But that's not what's going on. God's leaving, leading Moses and his people into a trap. But not a trap for his people, a trap for Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh pursues with his armies and they block the Israelites in. Red Sea on one side, army on the other. And God uses that as, a, that as an occasion to show his power, both by parting the Red Sea and by destroying the Egyptian army. You know, Moses wanted to make it to the mountain of God, but God takes him to the Red Sea instead. But Moses does what God wants. Moses wanted the people to obey God, but what do they do instead? They build idols. You know, God, in his frightening way, delivered commandments to the people, and the people agreed that they would obey this God, but within a short amount of time they built idols was specifically what they were commanded not to do. Moses wanted the people to trust him as a leader. Did they? No. They complained. They complained about what God was or wasn't doing. They complained about whether Moses was a fit leader or not. Even Moses' own sister bickered with him and fought with him to the point where God punished her. You know, in a life of detours, I think the final one had to be most difficult. Moses had intended to lead those people into the promised land. He got them there. They sent in the 12 spies. The 10 spies come back with an unfaithful report, and the people trust the spies. Had the people trusted Joshua and Caleb, you know what? Moses would have let them in. But because the people didn't, and Moses' frustration with those people led him to take credit for God's work, Moses didn't even get to go into the promised land he was taking them to. It was a life of detours, similar to the life of Paul. To get over to the New Testament, I want you to turn with me to Acts. Again, you know the story of Paul's life, how he was set up to be one of the up-and-coming Jewish leaders. He had studied under Gamaliel, best of the Jewish teachers. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the seventh day, a Pharisee, which was a hard, uh, hard thing to, to accomplish. He was, according to his own admission, Faultless before the law. And yet he gets detoured by a vision he has on the road to Damascus on the way to persecute Christians. And his life completely changed. Well, even after he started obeying Christ and he had been baptized to have his sins washed away and he was now a committed follower of the kingdom of God and he was committed to the message of reconciliation that we talked about over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul continued to experience detour. Look with me at the beginning of Acts 16. Paul went on to Derby and Lystra. Now why was he going there? To preach the message of reconciliation, right? 
he was going to share the message of hope. He was going as an obedient servant in the kingdom of God, as a, as a gospel deliverer. Read with me. Where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was Greek. The brothers and sisters at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him, so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places since they all knew his father was a Greek. As they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for the people to observe. The letter that's mentioned at the end of chapter 15. So the churches were strengthened and the faith they grew daily in numbers. That, that all sounds great, doesn't it? Keep reading. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Where did Paul want to go? What job did he want to do? He had a whole plan. You know, Asia's a big place. <laughs> this wasn't an easy undertaking Paul wanted to take. He wanted to go out into Asia where it seems that probably the gospel wasn't spreading much and he wanted to spread the gospel there among the Gentiles. He had a great co-worker with him named Timothy. They were going to go out there and they were going to share the gospel with all the people he needed to hear. He was going to make a difference. The Holy Spirit said no. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Now he stopped again. Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and during the night Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. He stopped once, then he stopped again, and then he's told, no, this is where you need to go. Here's the vision. Here's, here's the plan you need to make. And so he makes it. Here's what's interesting to me. The next few verses, verses 11 through verse 15, tell the story of who they met when they got to Macedonia. Was it a man? No. Yeah, you know, I, I imagine Paul had these visions of going to Macedonia. You know, he wants to go to Asia, he stopped. That's not where you need to go. He wants to go to Bithynia or Mythia, he stopped. That's not where you need to go. So then he gets this vision from God, here's where you need to go. And I would imagine because of the effect that he had had in so many places, he wanted to go and he was going to bust doors open. He was going to turn the world upside down. He was going to do all this stuff for God the same way his zeal led him to do for the Jews. And he gets there, and instead of finding a man, he finds a woman. It seems that Paul's habit, you read over in the beginning of chapter 17, was to go into a city and go into the synagogue of the city and spend several weeks reasoning and teaching the Jews in that area about the Messiah before he would open up the door for the Gentiles in an area. But when he gets to Philippi, it seems there's not a synagogue. There's not even faithful Jews in this area. According to tradition, you had to have 10 Jewish men in order to establish a synagogue. The fact that Paul goes to the riverside and not to the synagogue is significant. You don't read of him going to a synagogue in Philippi likely because there wasn't one. God says, go to Macedonia when he gets there, there's not the work to be done. So now all of a sudden he has to do the work in a different way than he's had to in the past. And so he goes down to the riverside, and it says they go down to the river expecting to find a place of prayer. 
expecting, you know, if they don't have a synagogue in which to assemble to pray, they're going to be down by the riverside. All these Jews that we can teach, and that's not what he finds. What he finds is a God-fearing woman named Lydia. But he teaches her. Then, in trying to continue the work in Philippi, he ends up getting himself arrested and on trial. It's a mess. But here's what I find interesting about Paul. It didn't matter what circumstances or obstacles stood in his way, he still was faithful to God's plan. Look with me over in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. The very, one of the last things we have of Paul's writing in the second letter to Timothy. Timothy, who was there with him in Philippi, says this. Chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. At my first defense, no one stood by me. Everyone deserted me. May it not be counted against me. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that I might fully preach the word and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, the story we have there in Philippi is fairly early in Paul's missionary works. Uh, over the span of his life, it's the beginning of his second missionary journey. When you get to the end of his life, he even faces obstacles there. He was alone in his trial. What do you learn about him? Doesn't matter. God was with me. And that's what matters. That's the lesson he learns over the years. God was with me. That's what matters. I love that. There is some debate as to what he means here when he says, so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Some people understood that or under think that that's just figurative speech, that he was rescued from danger. There are many in the early church who believe that that was a literal statement. That Paul was in prison, and just like happened to many of those Christians in that time period, Paul was facing punishment like being thrown to the lions and possibly had even literally been thrown to the lions, yet somehow was preserved. And what he says is, God kept me safe. an amazing statement. If ever there was a man who faced detours, it was Paul. Detours in doing the Lord's work, it was Paul. And what he learned through all of it is that he should be content with God's plan, God's way, for God's timing and God's glory. That's the lesson for us. There are going to be a lot of times when your life detours a lot. Sometimes we're just talking about regular life, like I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon. I had a plan for a certain career, and I got detoured to an entirely different plan, not even for bad reasons, for wonderful reasons, for the pursuit of the one who is now my wife. That's a detour. And there have been many of us, I imagine, we could go around and tell story after story in here of major detours that our life have taken. Just We never saw this coming, but it's the way things happen, and we learned to live with it. We, we, we rolled with it. The key is, don't just roll with it and be upset about it, or roll with it and feel discontent, or roll with it and go, well, there's nothing I can do about it, but Take the perspective of Paul. You know what? God's with me, so it's okay. I, 
my plan sometimes intersects with you, parallels God's plan, and we're walking step and step, and we're going exactly the way I thought things should go. But there are other times when my path intersects with God's path, I have a choice to make. Am I going to continue to do it the way I think I should do it, or am I going to step off my path so that I can go on God's path? That's the choice you're left with. But if you'll choose God's plan, do it God's way, in God's time, for God's glory, you'll do well. Every time. 2 Timothy chapter 2, since you're pretty close to that already, turn with me back to the beginning of chapter 2. There's a reading here, starting in verse 3. I want to read verse 3 down through verse 7. Share in sufferings as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one is suffering as a soldier, gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. This passage teaches us the three points of our sermon. Verse 4 there, no soldier gets entangled in per civilian pursuit since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Doesn't that teach that we pursue God's plan, not our own. That our aim, our goal, the things we do, we do because it pleases the one who enlisted us. We don't get entangled in the things of this life. We don't get entangled in our own plans. We don't get wrapped up in the way we think life should go because ultimately what we think doesn't matter. It's what our commander And then that next verse, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Doesn't that teach us that when God's plan is different than our plan, when God chooses something that we didn't choose, that it, we have to do it God's way because there are God's rules? God's rules are really what matter? And then verse 6 there, it's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crop. It's a little bit of an odd verse in this train of thought. But I think what it's saying there is that if we'll do things God's way, if we'll be a faithful soldier, if we'll be a rule-following athlete, that we will be the ones who get to enjoy the produce from the crops that we've harvested for God. That we'll be that hard-working farmer that gets to enjoy the fruit if we'll just do things God's way. It's hard to be derailed. It's hard to face that. It's hard to realize your plans were not God's plans. It's hard to realize that God's way makes more sense than our way when we've got everything already figured out. I tell you, look back over your life and all the things that got derailed. How many of them worked out? Probably nearly all of them. Because you learn to trust God. In another book that I was reading this past week, because, man, i got to get three books in a month, I came across this reading. It's by a guy named Jocko Willink. Jocko Willink was a Navy SEAL, Lieutenant Commander. Uh, he was part of SEAL Team 3, who played a significant role in the Iraq War. And he's become a speaker, a bit of a motivational speaker and uh, nutritional guy and that sort of stuff. But he, he had this thing that he wrote that I, I just thought was fantastic. And I want to read it to you. How do I deal with setbacks, failures, delays, defeats, and other disasters? I actually have a fairly simple way of dealing with these situations, summed up in one word good. 
That is something that one of my direct subordinates, one of the guys who worked for me, a guy who became one of my best friends, pointed out. He would pull me aside with some major problem or issue that was going on, and he'd say, boss, we've got this thing, this situation, and it's gone terribly wrong. And I would look at him and say, good. Finally, one day, he was telling me about something that was going off the rails, and as soon as he finished explaining it to me, he said, I already know what you're going to say. And I asked him, what am I going to say? And he said, you're going to say, good. He continued, that's what you always say. When something is going or something is wrong or going bad, you just look at me and say, good. And I said, well, I mean it, because that's how I operate. So I explained to him that when things are going bad, there's going to be some good that will come from it. Oh, the mission got canceled? Good. We can focus on another one. Didn't get the new high-speed gear we wanted? Good. We can keep it simple. Didn't get promoted? Good. More time to get better. Didn't get funded? Good. We own more of the company. Didn't get the job you wanted? Good. Go out, gain more experience, and build a better resume. Got injured? Good. Needed to take a break from training. Got tapped out? Good. It's better to tap out in training than tap out on the street. Got beat? Good. We learned. Unexpected problems? Good. We have to figure out a solution. That's it. When things are going bad, don't get all bummed out. Don't get started. Don't get frustrated. No. Just look at the issue and say, good. Now, I don't mean to say something trite. I'm not trying to sound like Mr. Smiley positive guy. That guy ignores the hard truth. That guy thinks a positive attitude will solve problems. It won't. But neither will dwelling on the problem. No. Accept reality, but focus on the solution. Take that issue. Take that setback. Take that problem and turn it into something good. Go forward, and if you're a part of a team, that attitude will spread throughout. Finally, if you can say the word good, then guess what? You're still alive. It means you're still breathing. And if you're still breathing, that means you've got some fight in you. So get up, dust off, reload, recalibrate, re-engage, and go out on the attack. For some reason, that spoke to me this week. We've had a year of detours back in 2020. And I think for many of us, we thought the turning of a calendar page or hanging a new calendar on the door would make that big of a difference. And maybe it has, maybe it hasn't for you. I don't know. I, I see politics are up to the same old tricks. That doesn't seem to have changed. People are still struggling financially. That doesn't seem to have changed. People are still hiding in fear of a disease. That doesn't seem to have changed. People are still having to be abundantly cautious, and because of that, they're having to struggle through relationships. I've seen more public debates on spiritual issues and church worthiness pop up in the past six months than I have in the past lifetime. Well, we got a younger generation that is so dissatisfied with the church and an older generation that is so disconnected from the younger generation of the church that it's creating problems. All of that are detours. And we can choose to look at that and get disheartened and get upset and be discouraged, or we can choose to look at it and say, good, good. Something good will come out of this if I'll just keep pursuing God's plan. Turn with me to one last passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so that I would not exalt myself. Verse 8. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me, but he said to me, My grace 
is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The detours we face in life are often the moments that make us feel weakest. Maybe by weakness I, I mean least in control. Because all of a sudden things are different than the way we expected them to be. Things are, are harder. Things are, they, they just, they seem harder to face. But the truth is, those are the times when life becomes most clear. Because when we realize that we don't actually have control of our day-to-day, -day, when we don't actually have control of even our year-to-year, -year, that God is the one who's truly in control, that's when life is most clear. Because it helps us to see what reality is. He is the one who we should follow. And He is the one with the answers and we are not. Ultimately, this lesson is about love. Because what is it that causes God to be so intimately involved in our lives but love? And that when things get difficult and hard, those are the times that we lean on those that we have a relationship with the most. When things are difficult to deal with, when I'm struggling with some issue with, with, with a brother or sister in Christ, or if I'm struggling with somebody I'm trying to teach the gospel to, or when life has kind of gone topsy-turvy, do you know who I lean on most? My wife. I should have said God, but I'm being honest with you today. It's my wife. And why do I lean on her? But because she has loved me and cared for me, and I know she wants what's best for me. Brothers and sisters, if that's true of my spouse, how much more true is that of my God? And when things get difficult or topsy-turvy or they spin out of control, it is God who holds us true. It is God who loves us through the, mo through the mess. And it is God who sets our path straight. And he does it because he loves us. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, learn to love a God like that. If you need the invitation to get your life right, to, as his plan says from the very beginning of our lesson, to sacrifice your life so that you might accept the benefit of Jesus' sacrifice, give up your life without God so that he can wash away your sins in baptism, Today's a good day to encourage you. If you've not made that kind of commitment, God's worthy of it. He's trustworthy. He'll hold you through it. And we encourage you to make that commitment today. If you need to get your life right through baptism, please come forward and let us.